well, it's 16. Yeah, we are in time. So thank you for your attention. Thank you for being here today. Uh, tarde, buenas tardes, good afternoon. Masa al khair. Um, we welcome you, especially with all the people who is uh, now linked through this uh, channel. Um, Professor uh, Khalili, thank you so much for being with us to this afternoon, for giving us your time. I would like to start a part of, um, you know, uh, greeting everyone who is uh, linked here um, with uh, that, uh, you know, I would like to, re to, to begin with re remaining that the 25% of the world trade and uh, is passing through the, the Strait of Malacca and almost 50% of energy resources is also passing for the Strait of Malacca. But we must oh, never forget that half arrived to the Mediterranean space to the Strait of Suez. So Mediterranean connections have no, so long defined the relationship across the SCs and uh, since the 20th centuries, these maritime connections have entailed intimate interviewing and the war and trade of business and colonies and post colonies, you know, uh, Mediterranean is even a space for trade, so it was dialogue for grown and, um, you know, we share most of the, you know, products of uh, culture and elements that they're sharing all our common countries. So. And also we share uh, common concerns around the labor, environment, subwarden, and urban development. And uh, for talking about those things and on more other things, I would like to introduce you to Dr. Lale Khalili, a professor of international politics at Queen Mary University of London. And uh, he, she's previously, she worked as a professor of the SOAS University of London, and she has participated in numerous research projects. Uh, Dr. Khalili has examined representation and practices involved violence in her books, Heroes and Martyrs in Palestine, The Politics of the National Commemoration, and uh, The Time of Shadows in Confinement and Counter Shields in two years in 1913. In addition, she is the author of Seniors of War and Trade, Shipping and Capitalism in the Arabian Peninsula, and uh, two years ago. And uh, it is her most recent work, which she explores the road of maritime infrastructures and conduits for the movement of the technology capital, people, and cargo. For the examples of shipping company MCM, Professor Khalidi draws the politics of the poor development and management in the Mediterranean basin, the devastating after effects of the unregulated shipping, and the contestated movements of people and cargo. So, thank you. We, I must remind you that we this uh, organized at the EMF. And uh, within the, the framework of the whole of Mediterranean, and also with the collaboration of the Masters of Logistics and International Trade at the University of Atolivia Theo of Barcelona. So, Professor Carilli, the floor is you. Thanks so much. Um, thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. Please forgive me if I'm speaking in English. I really wish I could be speaking in. Um, either Spanish or Catalan, since um, this is supposed to be taking place in Barcelona. And I am extremely sorry not to be in Barcelona, which is my favorite European city. Um, and I would have loved to be there, but unfortunately COVID has made it impossible. Um, I also want to remind everyone who's attending that you are very welcome to put your questions in the Q&A, which is at the bottom of the screen at the furthest right. Um, and you could do so, you could add your questions as um, the presentation's going on. So please just feel free to add them so that when we finish, I'll be very happy to answer your questions. Um, I'm going to now sh uh, just take a minute to share my screen. So please forgive me as I do that, because I'm going to uh, show you a Microsoft PowerPoint. Um, so let's see. Just one moment. While I make that the full screen. Okay. Um, so um, I'd like to begin with uh, this particular image that you can see, which I took in Malta um, uh, from uh, the port of Marsa Schlock, which is uh, one of the major trade hubs of uh, CMACGM uh, in Europe. And um, it is an image that I think conveys some of what I want to talk about. Um, it, it shows an extraordinarily beautiful spot. Um, it shows a beach right there, and it shows one of the largest ships that at the time uh, 
uh, was uh, on the seas. Uh, CMA CGM is a shipping company that I'm going to be talking about in a little bit of time uh, in a moment, but I thought that this image was particularly striking. That ship is actually a ship that I traveled on as part of my uh, research project for Seniors of War and Trade. I took two trips on container ships, both of them starting in Malta and both of them ending in Jabal Ali in the port of Dubai uh, in the Arabian Peninsula. Um, and this was actually one of the ships that I took. Um, and it's quite extraordinary to be able to do this kind of research because you get a sense of the day-to-day -day effects of something that is so large scale, so enormously important. Um, and so what I want to do today is to speak a little bit about port infrastructures, travel routes, cargo routes, and then something about the politics that is involved in the making of these infrastructures and routes. So the subsidies that um, uh, the shipping companies receive, uh, the taxes that they pay or don't pay, the labor conditions um, uh, that are involved in the processes of maritime uh, logistics, and the environmental transformations that arise as part of uh, the processes um, of maritime shipping. And then I'm going to spend a little bit of time towards the end of my talk um, um, talking about CMACGM, which is at the moment the third largest shipping company in the world, and it is headquartered in Marseille. Um, and and as I think in some ways it is an extraordinary representation, not only of global maritime transformations, not only of the sort of the large scale um, maritime logistics, but also very importantly of the kinds of Mediterranean connections that are so central to um, European role, the European role in maritime trade. Um, and and then I'll end with some reflections on the Mediterranean as a space, not only of mobility, which of course, many of you um, being in a master's on logistics are probably thinking about uh, mobility, but also of immobility and the ways in which containment of movement is also part of the process of management um, of, of, uh, of transportation, but also transit. So I want to begin with this little map, and what you'll see on this little map uh, is a, the uh, 20 uh, largest ports surrounding the Mediterranean, um, but this is in 2018. Uh, some of these ports have shifted up and down, but as you can see, uh, the listing of the ports is quite striking. Um, the first two ports, uh, two, the first major ports um, are in Valencia, the next two are in Eastern Mediterranean. Um, uh, in, uh, in where the um, Marmara Sea uh, sits and the port of Piraeus on the Aegean. Then it's Giao Tauro in the boot of Italy, in the tip of the point of Italy. And finally, Marsa Schlock, um, Genoa, Barcelona at number eight, Port of Mersin in Turkey, uh, and La Spezia in Italy. So, and, and then, of course, there are others. What is really striking about this uh, is that so many of these ports are in the northern Mediterranean. Now, Tanger Med, um, which is number 18 over on uh, the left side of the image in the west side, is fast growing and surpassing some of these other ports. And I think that that is also quite interesting that the introduction of a southern Mediterranean port into this um, mix um, is going to be in Morocco. There are also a number of eastern Mediterranean ports, um, and those are, of course, particularly significant are the ports of Israel, um, uh, Haifa, and Ashdod. Okay. Um, the reason that I wanted to show this is to show something about the expanse of the different ports that we see. Um, but what is also interesting is... Um, the ways in which the, let me see, where is the, there it is. Um, one of the other things that's really interesting about this is the ways in which the routes um, of travel um, are shaped in the um, Mediterranean. This is an image that I captured. Uh, I wanted it to be very up to date. So I just captured it a couple of days ago, yesterday, maybe even, um, on uh, a website called Vessel Finder. Now, if those of you who are in maritime logistics probably know that there are some really extraordinary um, online websites where you can actually track ships. You can track the traffic into the different ports. And what you can see is that in some ways, the image that we see here in this image from uh, just the last couple of days corresponds to the previous image that I showed you. 
this one, in the sense that the most major ports are along the northern edge of the Mediterranean. So if I move my cursor, you can see this. So these are the major ports. And when you actually see this image, you also see that the traffic is um, really in a major way um, along the northern part of the Mediterranean Sea. So that is something also to keep in mind, is that, of course, the routes of travel ma matter um, enormously. Um, as Sergio mentioned just before the introduction, Suez Canal is really enormously important, as is Gibraltar, as two straits through which an enormous amount of uh, traffic um, arrives into the Mediterranean. The Suez is particularly important because it tends to be the shipping route from which uh, pr produced goods, produced cargo from China, but also importantly, hydrocarbons, um, oil, natural gas, and various other petrochemicals arrive from the Middle East. And so uh, the closure of Suez Canal, whenever given that ship closed the Suez Canal, actually translated into quite a lot of backup uh, and disruption in the processes of uh, trans the, the, tra the, the um, processes of traffic in the Mediterranean. Now, one of the other things that is really interesting about this is that these particular routes, as you can see from uh, these routes kind of translate to uh, the image that I just showed you about the vessel traffic, is the extent to which um, these routes tend to be um, constant over time. Part of this is, of course, uh, the location, the geographic placement of particular places. If the Suez is going to be on the eastern part of the Mediterranean and, um, and Gibraltar is on the western part, a direct route between the two is going to be one of the most heavily trafficked. If for example, a route through Bosphorus um, tends to be the only connection that one can have through maritime transportation to the important oil ports on the Black Sea, then that is going to also be quite significant. And so we're looking at this image, one of the things that you'll see is the thickness of this gray route from Suez to Gibraltar, and then they're also the same route going through to the Black Sea. Now, another reason that I wanted to choose this image, although this is quite an old image, this is from 2009, one of the reasons that I really wa uh, wanted to choose this is because of the fact that if you look at this image, you'll see these little brown squares everywhere. And what those are uh, um, is that it, they indicate oil spills, um, uh, oil spills resulting from shipping. And one of the things that I want to draw your attention to is the concentration of these oil spills in this area around the port of Piraeus in Greece. Um, now, part of the reason for that is because Piraeus happens to be one of the most important ports for the, trans for the transportation of oil, not only from the Black Sea, but also for bunkering. Bunkering or refueling ships tends to be one of these um, very important activities of ports. And Piraeus is one of the most significant bun bunkering ports. Um, in the Mediterranean. There is a historic reason for this. So I mentioned the geographic placement of places, but there's also historic reasons for why certain ports tend to uh, specialize in particular kinds of transportation. And I think part of the conversation that we're going to have today is going to draw out some of these political reasons. One of the most important in the case of Greece is the involvement of green sh uh, the Greece, Greek shippers in uh, the transportation of oil via tankers. So Greek shipping has been quite important. And one of the things that it has often dominated uh, maritime transportation has been in bulk and um, and fuel shipping. So bulk, uh, uh, dry bulk and uh, wet bulk, fl fluid bulk or uh, hydrocarbon shipping. And so, of course, when you're going to be specializing in that area, you're going to see quite a lot of um, accidents and oil spillages that happen around that factor. Again, if you look at this map, you'll see also that the routes tend to be much more heavily drawn towards the northern part of the Mediterranean and to some extent in the eastern part. And 
much less so on the southern part of Mediterranean. Now, this is a little bit surprising in part because Libya, of course, is one of the most significant um, sort of shipping uh, location, shipping sites um, for oil, uh, it being one of the biggest producers of oil um, in the Arab world. Um, and of course, this image is from 2009. So it is quite striking that uh, shipping routes out of Libya tend not to dominate this image, despite the fact that Libya is so important. Algeria, on the other hand, does appear on this map. And Algeria, of course, is another uh, uh, country with oil shipping. So again, keep this in mind. When you look at this, this uh, map also shows something else, which I think is quite significant and we should pay attention to. The circles that you see on the map indicate the volume of container traffic. And container traffic, um, it's quite interesting because although fewer container ships are out there than tankers, because of the value added of container traffic, there tends to be a lot more value uh, that sits on container ships being transported. And the volume of, uh, of course, container traffic here is what we're pointing to. And you'll see that, of course, uh, Valencia, um, and uh, Algeciras uh, and uh, the, the ports uh, in uh, Italy, Genoa uh, and uh, uh, Giao Tara tend to be quite important in that regard. Now, one of the things that is quite significant about uh, ports, and I think this is something that I wanted to show you, is that when I decided to book my uh, research journey on uh, CMA CGM, I assumed that I would be leaving out of a port from Marseille because uh, CMA CGM is headquartered in the city of Marseille in France. But it turned out that actually the port of Marseschlock in Malta is a much more significant significant transit port and a much more significant operating port for CMA CGM than the port of Marseille. So uh, that's the first thing. The second thing was that once I actually uh, started doing this research and I started traveling to Marseille, it became clear to me that even the port of Marseille itself was actually not a significant, the city of Marseille itself was not actually a significant hub of transportation for CMA CGM. Now, this is a particularly striking element about uh, shipping today, and that is the transformation over time of the processes of uh, construction of ports. So one of the things that I wanted to talk about today was this infrastructural investment in ports. If you look at the left, the image on the left, um, you'll see a map of central Marseille. If you've ever been to central Marseille, one of the things you'll notice is that the kind of um, restaurants, the touristy restaurants and bars, uh, but also very importantly, the fish market and the Marseillaise people themselves use tend to be very much concentrated around this area where the blue uh, arrow is pointing. And what this uh, area shows is the Vieux-Port of Marseille. This was the important historical port of Marseille, which until the 19th century was the main port where, from which uh, the French shipping to North Africa happened. Um, and of course, we know that uh, Algeria in particular was a colony of France. And for that reason, uh, the Vieux-Port was not only important for the forms of trade that emerged, but from the from 1830s uh, onwards, it was very important also as a strategic port for the maintenance of um, uh, France's colonies across, uh, not only across the Mediterranean, but also so then across on the West, West African uh, side of Africa, the, in, in that case, those ships were leaving and not only going across the Mediterranean, but also going through Gibraltar to Senegal and elsewhere. However, towards the end of the 19th century, um, the Vieux-Port ended up being not quite um, uh, as uh, deep or as large uh, as both the trade and the strategic needs um, of uh, Marseille, but also France in general required. Additionally, of course, we see the incredible increase in the traveling of um, uh, passengers on board passenger ships. This is, of course, before airplanes uh, that were leaving from uh, the important ports of Mediterranean and Marseille was one of those. And so, and Vieux-Port could not accommodate those. Um, so 
towards the end of the 19th century, a shift happens further. This map is um, uh, a little bit uh, d directionally um, in shifted around, but we see a shift further north and further west from Vieux-Port towards what is called the Port Modern or the modern port in uh, Marseille, which is still a functioning port. Now, one of the things that one sees today, if you go to Marseille, is that you'll notice that in Vieux-Port, most of the ships that are sitting there are either pleasure cruises, small ferries, ferries that um, essentially just go in the area, or small shipping boats. Um, and so um, these, uh, not so, sorry, small fishing boats. And so this is quite um, a picturesque, quite a beautiful area, but it is essentially no longer a freight port. Um, and I think that is something that um, is quite important to recognize. However, when you look at the Port Modern, one of the things that we see, one of the, if you travel there and you take a look at it, is that while at some stage until um, about the 1980s and the 1990s, it, it was the main freight port of Marseille, it is today primarily used by cruise ships and passenger ferries. Passenger ferries that go to either Corsica or across to Algeria or cruise ships that go from Marseille to elsewhere, um, all around the Mediterranean or even further afield. Um, and also the uh, makeup, the, the, the sort of the uh, shape and um, uh, commerce that is shaped around the modern port is very different than uh, Port Modern. It tends to be uh, old warehouses that have been transformed into big chain restaurants. So what happens to the big freight um, and tankers that are um, leaving from Marseille? What is fascinating about this is that if you uh, actually look up the port of Marseille, what you'll see is a reference to Faux-sur-Mer. Faux-sur-Mer is about 40 to 50 kilometers west of Marseille. So if you look at the larger map over on the right side, you'll see the city of Marseille indicated with the blue um, oh. arrow. And uh, you'll, you'll also see that uh, there is the red arrow over on the left, which points to Faux-sur-Mer. Faux-sur-Mer is actually the, um, a much larger port and it handles the trade. But despite the Faux-sur-Mer being there, being a much larger port, um, it is, in fact, still secondary to Malta as the primary European hub of CMA-CGM. What are the reasons for these shifts? One of the significant things that has happened that we've seen happen over the course of the 20th century is this particular kind of shift from an, a center, city center port to a modern port further up and from there to a further port miles outside of the city um, has been facilitated through two major transformations. The first of these transformations is port switch, uh, ships switching uh, to petroleum and petroleum loading and bunkering being something that has um, often is argued has to happen at a further distance from the cities for health and safety reasons. But more importantly, containerization, the change from bulk transport to uh, containers uh, from the 1960s uh, and especially 1970s onwards has been one of the main reasons for this process. As Mark Levinson, in his wonderful history of containers, uh, shipping containers, has written, uh, the, the book is called The Box, um, this uh, shift has had two major effects. I mean, it has had loads of major effects, but two of the major effects that it has had has been that it has resulted in the main freight ports shifting miles outside in order to have larger spaces in which they can store containers. But one of the other effects has been of course, uh, an outcome of both the shift outside of cities, but also the process of automation on the ports. And that has been the cutting off of labor on these ports from the city itself. So we know that historically, um, people that have been engaging in, uh, in uh, dock work have been some of the most contentious folks. And so this shift further and further up has cut them off from the potential support they could receive from the cities. Now, Going back to um, the effects that um, we have seen is that is, is that what one of the things that we have um, noted has been the transformations that sorry, 
what well, has been the transformations that have resulted um, because of COVID uh, that have affected uh, container shipping. And I want to talk about this a little bit because it will lead us to some of the some of the important discussions that we'll see. Um, one of the things that you'll see uh, if, if you do a quick search of the news um, is that uh, when COVID uh, lockdown started, we saw um, news about a lot of shipping companies being very worried about their profits. And so we saw actually massive subsidies being given to shipping companies. Um, for example, CMACGM tapped French the French loan scheme to boost uh, its cash. Um, the French also gave quite a large uh, amount of uh, subsidies to MSC, which is another shipping company not necessarily based in France. Um, what is really interesting about this is that the top news item that you'll see on the left, which talks about the subsidy process, was in May 2020. In November 2021, so a year and a half later, one of the things that we see is that CMACGM has reported that its profits has jumped to some of the highest it has had. We see this news item about enormous, uh, these enormous jumps in shipping profits um, in all of the shipping companies. But I thought that the juxtaposition of CMACGM requesting uh, subsidies from the government uh, and then having this massive profit is something that we have to keep an eye on in the Mediterranean because it tends to be quite significant, quite important. Um, one of the other things that is quite interesting is if you look at the subsidies that different countries have received as part of the COVID uh, process has been, um, you'll, you'll see across these kinds of um, uh, countries, across the major shipping companies, is that you'll see that Singapore, for example, uh, or South Korea um, have given uh, massive uh, uh, subsidy packages uh, as a result of COVID to shipping companies, et cetera. But in a number of other places uh, when you look there are specific uh, countries that have been recipients um, of this uh, of this uh, covid um, subsidies and these subsidies have resulted or have allowed for uh, these shipping companies and you'll see their names here cma cgm in this case the msc cruise line not the msc freight line but then if you go further down and um, you'll see that uh, taiwan has also subsidized yang ming and evergreen the two very large shipping companies that are based out of um, chinese um, out of ta taiwan you'll see that these have uh, tended to be some of the recipients and hmm in south korea of um, some of the most important uh, some of the biggest large uh, and largest recipients of these kinds of subsidies. Why does this matter? Part of the reason that this matters is because as the International Transport Forum for uh, the OECD um, reports, these forms of subsidies um, tend to actually keep many of these shipping companies afloat, regardless of whether or not these shipping companies are profitable. And, um, and of course, uh, one of the things that comes out of that is that despite their profitability or lack thereof, um, there's also, uh, uh, they, they continue to, re to receive these subsidies. One of the other things that the International Transport Forum of the OECD has reported is that in addition to the direct forms of subsidies that the shipping companies have received, liquidity boosts and various other kinds, they have also received what the, IT, uh, the International Transport for Forum calls shadow subsidies. And shadow subsidies are those subsidies that um, uh, essentially allow for shipping companies to receive, uh, to, to bump up their profits. Um, so in a way, what you'll see, what you're seeing is income shifting from freight forwarders and from other companies, from their clients to the shipping companies. And I think that this is something that freight forwarders in particular um, are complaining about. Um, it, this is, the, it's called a shadow subsidy because it is um, really very difficult to trace. Um, although the International Transport Forum and Olaf Merck, who heads it, do a wonderful job of tracing this. And it is very difficult um, to follow it, uh, but you can see that it does actually, these forms of shadow subsidies tend to be quite important and they existed particularly during COVID time uh, with the rise in shipping rates, which are then passed on to freight forwarders and then from freight forwarders to actually retail customers, retail or commercial customers.
There is another factor that I think is really quite significant, and I think that, again, the International Transport Forum has focused on, and this is particularly, I'm listing here uh, the name of the author of the article who's tabulated this, is the extent to which the COVID um, has um, clarified, but this is, of course, predates COVID, the extent to which COVID has clarified um, that the kinds of subsidies that shipping companies receive are not only in the forms of direct liquidity, etc., but also so essentially in uh, forms of tax avoidance um, that shipping companies in particular um, enjoy, um, and particularly in the OECD um, uh, countries. Um, I'm going to make the PowerPoint available. So if you need to look this information up, you're very welcome to do so. But one of the things that this particular article by Olaf Merck has shown is, oops, is that uh, shipping um, receives, uh, is effectively paying, and if the effective tax rate, corporate tax rate on shipping companies is 7%. So, um, I don't know which countries in the world uh, you guys pay tax rates on, but as individuals, uh, we often could have effective tax rates of anywhere between 20 to 40 percent marginal tax rates, sometimes higher than that. Um, and what is really fascinating about this uh, particular table, again, tabulated by Olaf Merck and his colleagues at the International Transport Forum, is the extent to which shipping companies in particular seem to be the beneficiaries of the kinds of tax avoidance schemes or the tax waivers. Um, and, and, and effectively, they pay very little taxes. This means that at a moment, like such as COVID, where we actually have enormous profit being made by um, these shipping companies, uh, they're actually not paying very much taxes off of that. And that profitability does not also pass on to the workers, which is the next thing I'm going to be talking about, um, which uh, it is essentially uh, consumed by uh, the shipping companies themselves. So, um, this uh, again, this table will be available, but also the source for it essentially is the International Transport Forum, should you be interested in that. Okay, now let's move to um, the question of labor. Um, there are several aspects of labor that is quite important. I've already talked about how the profitability of um, shipping does, is not really passed on to the people who work on the ships um, or on the docks uh, in any kind of measurable way. Um, I want to speak a little bit about the work aboard ships because I think it's one of the, it has seen as a, as a workplace, it has seen one of the most major transformations um, anywhere. Um, the everyday work aboard ships essentially are largely in, uh, can be divided into two categories, um, the work above deck and the work below deck. Um, this image is um, uh, from a picture that I took from one of those uh, big ships that I was on in 2015. And one of the things that you can see is this enormous engine room, uh, which allows for these mega ships to uh, travel across the sea. These engine rooms are also some of the hardest places to work because they are very, um, uh, they're incredibly hot. They, um, they're incredibly dangerous. You could burn yourself by touching anything, but also things can blow up. And it is also, it requires extraordinary amounts of skill, um, because essentially what you have is some of the most sophisticated machinery, some of the biggest engines that you have on board. But when a ship is out in the middle of the, say, the sea, out, of, uh, out in the middle of the Pacific, or out in the middle of Mediterranean, for that matter, um, if your engine breaks down, essentially what you have is dependence on the artisanal skills of the engineers and ships repair folks to fix this. So the everyday work of shipping below deck um, requires a, a enormous amount of engineering skill. Above deck, uh, the work also uh, requires skill, but it also tends to be much more repetitive in ways that are quite striking. Um, one of the things that um, have, uh, people have written about as long as they have written about shipping, is that you constantly have to paint your ship. Because of course, when you go to sea, the salt water massively affects um, the integrity of the ship's hulls. And so the people who work aboard ships have to start painting the ship. And as soon as they're finished painting the whole of the ship, they have to start again. And so there's a degree of tedium involved in the kind of day-to-day -day work of ship's crews um, 
also uh, the day-to-day -day cooking, the day-to-day -day maintenance and cleaning. And then, of course, the officers, the day-to-day -day, um, ensuring that the ship is um, going in the right direction, that it is not going to uh, c collide with anything that is going on. And, of course, other concerns that are quite significant. And so this is um, uh, the work aboard ships um, is enormously significant and even harder during COVID times, in part because of the limitations, the, the, the fact that COVID has affected um, perhaps seafarers like many other frontline workers, logistical workers, more so than almost any others with the exception of perhaps medical workers. So the first banner that you see here is actually from another ITF, this, this time the International Transport Workers Federation, a global union, not the research arm of the OECD. And one of the things that the ITF, the International Transport Workers Federation, has pointed out to is the extent to which COVID has had a detrimental effect on the working conditions of seafarers in particular. Um, why? As you know, the um, COVID process resulted not only in, for example, large numbers of crew members aboard cruise ships um, catching COVID um, and then being quarantined on board ships, sometimes having to be um, helicoptered off because they were so ill and yet they could not land, they, could, uh, they couldn't come to a port. But also, in addition to that, um, seafarers not on cruise ships also had extremely difficult works. There is international treaties that try to raise regulate working conditions aboard ships. And these international treaties require seafarers to be off a ship after 11 months. So the upper limit, the maximum is supposed to be 11 months. Um, on the ships that I was on, the seafarers, the crewmen often worked for nine months and then they had a month off and then they had to come back and keep working. Officers have shorter contracts. They could usually work four to five months, um, sometimes two months if they're the captain. But for ordinary crewmen, the upper limit was supposed to be 11 months, and most of them worked nine months. When COVID happened, for a number of reasons, but the primary one being borders and airlines being shut down, seafarers were stuck on board the ships. And so there are, there are instances of seafarers having to remain on board the ship with their contracts um, having ended. So essentially, they're not being paid away uh, any wages for sometimes up to 24 months. So imagine being on board a ship for two years, not really having seen your family for two years, um, having not having been paid your wages for about a year of that, or for at least a significant portion of that. And, um, and in many instances, not having internet connections to talk to your, um, to talk to your family unless you're in port. Um, and so this, the effects of COVID have been extraordinarily detrimental to seafarers. They have also been to some extent detrimental to dock workers, in part because the kind of labor that is required requires um, engagement with one another. And so it has also exposure um, uh, to different um, kinds of uh, illnesses is one character of, uh, characteristic of work. So we have this extraordinary circumstances that COVID has produced, but we have the everyday works. Now, there are some of the other factors that I want to mention, and I think they're quite important to talk about when we're talking about maritime labor, is the role of port management companies. One of the things that has been really interesting is the extent to which um, port management companies actually try to limit the ability, not, not in this instance of seafarers, but of dock workers to organize. One particular example that I often like to give is of the gateway, London Gateway, but there are also instances of this happening around the Mediterranean in ports managed particularly by Dubai Ports World. So the image that you'll see on the right is Dubai Ports World and London Gateway. Um, it's, uh, D Dubai Ports World is a um, container terminal management company. Um, it is the fourth largest, sometimes the third, sometimes the fourth largest in the world after companies that are based in Hong Kong, Shanghai, and Singapore. Um, and it actually manages not only, of course, Dubai, but some of the largest um, terminals um, in Europe as well. The largest one that it manages is the Rotterdam Gateway, but it also manages London Gateway, and it also manages some, port term some terminals um, around the Mediterranean. Thank you.
One of the things that is significant about its management in London was that when it took over the management of London Gateway, and it, when it received the concession to manage it, it refused to recognize the collective bargaining rights of the dockers on um, London Gateway. There was a series of different kinds of uh, political activities, political actions by dockers, um, not only in London, but also in solidarity. So there were solidarity actions, I believe, in Genoa, um, but also in, um, uh, in Durban, in South Africa, uh, of dockers who refused to on board ships coming from London Gateway in order to force London Gateway to um, recognize uh, the Dockers Union. Um, unfortunately, these solidarity movements did not really result in any action. And the union, uh, the Unite, which was uh, meant to represent the Dockers, had to go to court to extract a recognition for DP World, although the bargaining process is still to be questioned. So the kind of internationalization of port management companies is one of the things that is quite significant um, in uh, the effect in, in terms of the effects it has um, in the Mediterranean. An example that I can give in the Mediterranean, which doesn't have to do with Dubai Ports World, is that um, in the case of uh, Port of Piraeus, um, after the Port of Piraeus, after Greece was formed, uh, was forced by the Troika to accept a series of austerity and privatization measures um, of its economy in return for, uh, and because of the, the, the sort of the, the conditions of it, uh, because of the crash that it suffered after 2008, was that a significant portion of the port has been privatized and sold to Costco, which is a shipping um, and other shipping port management, uh, Chinese shipping uh, port management companies. And although those Chinese companies have not necessarily uh, stopped the uh, union activism, certainly one of the things that the militant doctors unions in Piraeus have complained about is about the possibility of the changes in their working conditions and their ability to respond to these new port management management companies. And this kind of internationalization actually limiting the ability of the workers in a particular location to demand certain workplace rights. Which brings us to the next next um, element, which is the kinds of activities that um, various kinds of um, uh, uh, dockers in particular can engage in um, in order to secure workplace rights. Now, there's a really interesting, um, uh, there, there was a really interesting um, uh, weekly, uh, sorry, monthly uh, newsletter that was produced until about 2016 or 17 by an insurance club in London called the Strike Club. This club, this insurance company, essentially, provided information to shipping companies about strikes um, at, on uh, docks and on board ships so that they could insure against it so that they knew what the risks were, etc. And one of the things that was fascinating, and the, in, uh, they, they've stopped producing this newsletter, which is a shame because it's obviously a very good research resource. Um, one of the things that was fascinating about this was that um, while there had been hundreds of strikes across the world on the docks, we have seen a massive reduction in the number of strikes that we see on board ships. And I'll come to that in a moment as to why that is. But one of the things that we see is that Dockers still continue to be enormously, importantly significant um, uh, strikers. And so we see here um, a, two different instances. Um, I believe actually the top um, one uh, is from Valencia. Um, and the bottom one is from Piraeus. And so you see these workplace activities, militant dockers unions that represent the workers. But what is also fascinating is that dockers are also engaged in forms of strikes or forms of political action that don't have to do with workplace rights. So in the Mediterranean in particular, because of the presence of um, radical uh, dockers unions in places like Genoa and Barcelona and Algeciras, what we have seen in the last uh, few uh, actually months, but especially in the last two or three years, have been instances of dockers refusing to unload ships going to uh, Israel or to Saudi Arabia. And so I think that that is 
uh, as you can see, um, the bottom picture, for example, uh, is uh, dockers refusing to allow ships that were carrying arms um, to Saudi Arabia to go there because of Saudi Arabia's um, war against Yemen, war on Yemen. And so these activities of dockers are fascinating because they are forms of disruption that can happen precisely because of the particular location of these dockers in the Mediterranean, um, where they are essentially nodes of movement between Europe itself, producer of arms, to destinations in the Middle East and further beyond. Okay, now beyond these kinds of workplace rights, there are some of the other things that I think are quite important to talk about, and those are uh, effects of containerization and also effects of um, flags of convenience. Um, flags of convenience is, of course, something that if you're working in logistics, you know something about. They're open registries um, that are essentially are located in, in countries in the world, which are also which are in essence offshore havens for shipping. There are two kinds of offshore processes for shipping companies. They can have their corporate headquarters or their ownership offshore. And for example, a large number of Greek um, uh, shipping companies, but also, for example, Norwegian shipping companies um, have their ownership registered in places like the Cayman Islands or Bahamas, um, the, the, sh the ships, uh, the, the, the company's ownership. So that means that the company's corporate records are really not open uh, because they are in Caymans or Bahamas. But in addition to that, you also have uh, the ships themselves that can be registered elsewhere. And that means that a company that, for example, is registered in Bahamas, uh, or in fact, a company that is registered in um, Italy or in Spain can have ships that are registered in Marshall Islands, in Liberia, in uh, Bahamas, in Panama, and in a number of other places. And Panama, Liberia, Marshall Islands, and Bahamas actually are the four largest um, uh, flags of convenience. And the reason that sh uh, companies might register their ships there is because they can evade um, insurance requirements, labor legislation, environmental legislation, um, and various other kinds of, they're quite lax these, um, because the countries in these places do not have the capacity to enforce these kinds of legislation. If a ship, for example, runs aground and has massive spillages, because these countries often don't have the capacity to send inspectors to inspect these instances, the ships can get away with it. So, um, one of the effects has been, that, of course, that many of the ships that come through the Mediterranean, if they are flying flags of convenience, they could potentially run into problems in ports in uh, the um, Middle East, uh, sorry, in the ports in the Mediterranean, um, in part because of the flags that they're flying means that their workers don't have very many rights, environmental, etc. Another factor that has been quite significant has been the effect of containerization, both for workers on board ships and workers on the docks. This is translated into securitization and militarization. So that means, for example, that some ships will end up having um, the, the, the sort of the container ports uh, will be heavily securitized in order to come in and out of ports. You have massive borders, um, uh, massive uh, kinds of um, uh, installations which are very difficult you sometimes even um, getting from the ship's berth where the ship has come off into the port itself requires providing not only ids but visas uh, etc this process of securitization um, has actually in increased since uh, 11th of september 2001 uh, where before that sailors seafarers could come onto the port with a with an internationally recognized seafarers card but now in some places they actually require a visa in order to be able to get off the ship so that has um, and this is in part because of containerization mm -hmm. and the creation of security requirements in ports themselves Another effect is distance from cities uh, where ports are disconnected from urban centers. You recall the um, earlier image that I showed, which showed uh, the, the port of Marseille being 40, 50 kilometers um, away from the center, center of Marseille, which of course means that um, uh, you know, the effect of containerization is you, you need a bigger place to put containers, but that means that also the ports are so far out of the cities where neither the dockers nor seafarers have the ability 
ability to reach the city very easily. This is translated for the dockers not having the support of the city, but it also has translated into seafarers that, for example, disembark in the port of um, Fort-sur-Mer may not find it very easy to go to the city of Marseille if they have 18 hours because they're going to have to take a taxi for 40 kilometers uh, in order to get that, and it's quite expensive. So that has been another effect. A third effect has been, of course, automation. And what this has translated into is that on the ports themselves, we see things called ghost ports. So very few people actually working in the ports, but on board the ships also, we see very few people working. So that original picture that I showed of the CMA CGM mega ship that I traveled on had a total of 30 people working on it. This is a ship that is as large as the Empire State Building. It is it, it is larger than uh, the Eiffel Tower is, uh, is uh, uh, long, and yet it only has 30 people working on it. And so I think this process of automation and the placing of people out of jobs is another fact. Finally, financialization has been another effect of containerization. Uh, containerization has allowed for the emergence of very large freight companies, very, very mega large freight companies. We don't see that kind of concentration um, in, uh, or oligopoly, if you will, um, in uh, bulk transport or even in oil transport, but we do see it in containerization. That lends itself to financialization and financialization can lend itself to asset stripping and other forms of processes that um, allow for certain companies to benefit financially, but does not work very well for the employees of those companies. Another factor I think that is quite important is environmental concerns. One of those is air pollution. Now, one of the things that we've seen is that in the course of the last uh, few years, the EU has required a change in the kind of fuel ships actually have. And so, um, for example, you see this is smoky, but actually a lot of the fuel that comes off the ships tends to be yellow, in part it, but because it has a huge amount of sulf uh, sulfites in it. Um, the EU has demanded that ships' fuels that have sulfide be reduced. Um, so ships that arrive into Mediterranean ports have less of that. But that demand is not part of the demands of any other uh, sort of uh, ships in the rest of the Mediterranean. So of course, you have this process of air pollution, which is a concern in those places. In addition, you also have the pollution of the water, which can happen because not only when it's like, uh, for example, a ship runs aground or has an accident, but often also uh, with things like, for example, uh, the uh, ballast water, the water that ships have to hold in order to keep their weight balanced, uh, could be dumped in one place. And so you could potentially have loaded ballast water in one part of the world and bringing it to the water in another part of the world. And one of the effects of that has been and, uh, the proliferation of invasive species from one place to another place. Sometimes also the ballast water mixes with fuel. And so, of course, you see the kind of thing you see here where, uh, whether intentionally or otherwise, you see the dumping of the water. So these environmental concerns are enormously important. In addition to that, the construction of infrastructures results in the um, dredging of the sea grounds and extension of the ports, which are quite important. Now, the last bit of this uh, lecture is about CMACGM, and I'm going to take five minutes and then I'll be more or less finished. CMACGM is located in Marseille, and you'll see that um, beautiful uh, headquarters, um, which uh, is um, des designed by the great Iraqi um, architect, late architect Zaha Hadid. CMACGM has a really interesting history. It is a combination of two different uh, companies, CMA, uh, and please forgive my terrible French accent, Compagnie Maritime d'Affretement, and CGM, Compagnie Générale Maritime. These two companies emer uh, merged in 1997. Um, but they emerged out of the Lebanese civil war. The founder of CMA, so the first part of the shipping, uh, were these two men at the bottom, Jacques and Johnny Saade, who had a, they were Lebanese Syrian, and they had a big shipping company in Beirut. But when the Lebanese civil war happened, they actually uh, moved to, uh, Jacques moved to Marseille and started a, a car transport company in Marseille. 
CMA expanded and expanded, and its work was primarily actually around the Mediterranean. So it would transport cars from uh, Beirut to Marseille and Marseille to Beirut, and it would actually expand it drastically. In 1997, while uh, CGM, so it, it acquired CGM, the uh, Compagnie Générale Maritime. Compagnie Générale Maritime is actually, uh, it was established first in 1851, and it was a colonial shipping company. It was the way France actually conducted its business in the Mediterranean. Um, it has, it was a company that allowed for colonial posts, colonial officers, and colonial cargo to travel across the Mediterranean. It then, Compagnie General Maritime, a few years later in the 19th century, acquired Compagnie General Transatlantique, which uh, allowed for uh, the France to maintain its colonies across the Atlantic and the Caribbean um, and in South America. And those uh, companies merged and they became Compagnie Générale Maritime again. Um, and they functioned as a kind of a uh, general maritime company attached to the government of France. And when they were uh, privatized in 1997, CMA acquired them and became CMA CGM. So CMA CGM is today the third largest shipping company in the world. As I mentioned, its headquarters are in Marseille. And of course, it operates extensively out of Fos sur Mer, but it also has hubs in Malta. And so if you look at, if you go to the CMA CGM website, it has pictures of all of the different routes its ships cover. But one of the things that's particularly striking about it is the extent to which uh, the company maintains particularly close relationships with ports, and shipping companies in the Middle East and Africa. There's a kind of continuation of colonial histories in the work of CMA CGM. And so you'll see these routes. And as you'll see, many of these routes actually function out of Malta. So Malta is very crucial to the routes to, for example, the Middle East, to the routes to Australia, and to the routes in the Mediterranean itself. So I have already also talked about the way that CMA CGM has benefited from the extensive subsidies and sort of tax avoidances that it has received. But these interconnections that allow for CMA CGM to have these connections across the globe are some one of the characteristics that makes the Mediterranean particularly interesting. The Mediterranean, having this long colonial history via France in particular, um, means that those colonial histories translate into interconnections that are still quite important. Some of those interconnections, of course, are what some of the post-colonial and anti-colonial theorists uh, would call a kind of a post-colonial backlash. And of course, one of those is the migration of peoples from the global south to the global north. As you know, particularly with the wars that were happening in Syria, but also with economic devastation and effects of the climate change, effects of climate change um, in Africa and effects of war in the Middle East and elsewhere, we have seen in the, particularly in the middle years of the 2010s, so between 2013 and 2017, 18, but also even continuing to today, we have seen enormous amounts of. Uh, uh, um, work by uh, various kinds of migrants to move from Eastern Mediterranean, from the Aegean, and from the Southern Mediterranean to Northern Mediterranean. This is translated in forms of uh, attempts at mobility, which have been managed and contained. And one of the final things that I want to leave you guys with is that the forms of mobility that we have seen, those enormous numbers of ships that we see traveling across the Mediterranean are the engines of transformation of global economies, but so are the forms of immobility that are enforced by, company, uh, by for example, institutions like Frontex, because what they do, these forms of immobility is actually to influence the transformation of uh, labor rights, they influence the movements of people, and they are quite significant. And I want to leave you with that final note that not only mobility, but also immobility in this instance matters. And so I will leave you with that. I'll, I'll end you and I'll end this PowerPoint. And I look forward to answering any questions you might have.
Well, thank you so much for those, these very interesting uh, speech. I really learned so much. And I must say that um, I was, I was working in the Department of Barcelona. My, my, my father worked for all his entire life in the, for um, as customers agents and uh, own shippers. So I was very used to go to cargo ships and to visit dockers. And well, and I must, I must say, I must confess to you that I was astonished with the first, you know, the first glance that you give. Because in my childhood, you know, the, uh, in the 70s and the 80s, the competence was between the Barcelona, Genova, Marseille, but I've seen Valencia and all the rest of the Hasidas uh, and all the rest of the harbors very, uh, very hard, um, very, very, but a lot of wave in the, in the URU and, you know, you know, the, the Mediterranean commerce. So I must say, I'm sure that will be a lot of questions, but I have me, myself, one of, uh, of us. So I will begin with this. And um, my question is, uh, how do you think it, it will impact um, in the, you know, in that space, the project, the EU project of the Mediterranean corridors, especially the sea highways, you know? So a couple of things. I think it's really interesting that you mentioned that Barcelona used to be such a really sort of a significant um, port, but that it has been surpassed by Valencia and Algeciras. And I actually think that that may not be such a bad thing, because I think that the expansion of these ports, on the one hand, is some elements of it are good for the economies, but of course they have very detrimental effects too, because as I mentioned, the ports end up moving out you know, of the cities, their jobs end up moving, um, there are questions of environmental degradation, etc. Um, the Mediterranean corridor is a fascinating um, uh, idea, and as it is with other forms of uh, notions of a kind of a corridor, um, it ends up often these kinds of um, plans uh, don't end up coming to fruition in, in precisely the ways in which they are imagined. I think there are elements of economic friction um, and political friction um, that, that influence the emergence of such processes. Some of those elements of friction um, are, of course, the shifting of economies, the shifting of shipping companies from one location to another um, location. Some of the others are political interference or political regulation. But some of the um, processes of, uh, for example, uh, competition between um, the, the ports on the one hand, but also the arrival of external actors, for example, the Chinese port management companies. And so in a sense, I, I'm kind of hesitant to make a future um, speculation in part because I think that those elements of friction are we're still uh, waiting to see what is going to happen. And, and, and I would actually be curious to think what you yourself think about that corridor, because I, as I said, I, I think that those elements of friction tend to be quite important, but perhaps, I, perhaps I'm being very cautious and not predicting anything. What Thanks do you again. think? <laughs> yeah. So, no, it's really important, you know, because of these Atlantic, the Mediterranean corridors will there are the, the commerce for the next, uh, for the far coming years. So it's a very, very interesting. You, you, you asked the money. Thanks for that. We have also here, uh, uh, you know, a question from Blanca comes uh, in which it said, thank you much for your presentation, Dr. Kalevi. I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about the security agent and the use of private security companies on board. Also about the relationships of the traffic and the special economic zones and FTZ. So thank you. Wonderful. Um, excellent question. So the securitization, there's two processes that happen. There's the process that happens on ports and there's the process that happens on board the ships. The process that happens on ports often translates into, um, as I said, sort of bordering at the ports, the, making it very difficult for seafarers to come on board, but also for dockers coming onto the ports themselves. Some ports are much more open than others. Some are very difficult to get into. Um, and I think that that is one of the elements that has emerged particularly and has intensified with 11th of September. One of the other elements that is quite interesting is that I had a German student who... Um some years ago, was really interested in the port of Hamburg and the processes of security on the port of Hamburg. And I think this is actually happens, this is something that happens not only in Hamburg, but also in some of the big Mediterranean ports, is that um, after a little bit of research, she noticed that the American Coast Guard um, has an attache in a lot of these uh, embassies in European countries, and the Coast Guard attache oh. is responsible, for example, for uh, in 
ensuring that shipping that goes from any of these ports to Europe goes through a process of security checks, et cetera, et cetera. Um, to me, that was fascinating because in a sense, it says the fact that the US with being such a sort of a large scale power, um, it tends to dictate uh, the security regimes of places far away uh, when they're allies. And I think that that was one of the elements of securitization that emerges. A second element of securitization that emerges is at sea. And this is not only on board ships, but also on the shipping routes. One of the things I should have um, shown some of the pictures that I took when I was on the ships, but one of the things that was fascinating for me was that when going through uh, particularly Bab al-Mandab in the Red Sea, so entering the Gulf of Aden um, and in, uh, in, the, in the Indian Ocean, what you ended up seeing was extremely frequent numbers of naval ships, not only from the EU, but specific EU countries. So the Netherlands, um, Italy, uh, but also from China and of course the US. Um, and so what you saw was the, the sort of um, presence of these um, naval forces in places that had a history, for example, of piracy. Um, and, this, and their presence was fascinating to me because in many instances, um, the naval ships actually would turn off their automatic identification systems. So you could see that there was a naval, the naval ship there, but you didn't know what it was. And so until you got close enough to be able to see it, and then once you got close enough, you would realize that it was a naval ship. And so that was also a process of securitization of the sea routes. There's finally an element of ship, uh, security at sea, which is what you mentioned, which is private security companies on board. Um, the two countries which have the most extensive instances of private security companies on board are Russia um, and uh, Israel, uh, which often have armed guards on board the ships that are flagged to their countries. Um, and these um, armed guards um, often also have weapons with them uh, on board the ships. But one of the things that I discovered more recently, which was fascinating, is that there's actually a very huge business. So, you know, there's the business of pri providing private security at sea, but there's also a huge business of providing arms to these private security men, because in many instances, they don't necessarily want to carry their um, extremely sort of um, uh, top of the line weaponry with them on board the ships. And so there's an entire business of uh, small, fast ships being essentially ocean armories, so carrying uh, RPGs, carrying other kinds of top of the line uh, weaponry and providing them to these armed security guards at sea. So these, are, these happen to be two very large scale businesses. And what we're seeing is that some of the places where these uh, private security firms are emerging are places where uh, histories of war has actually generated um, expertise, if you will, uh, in that kind of work. And so we see South African um, uh, companies, we see Russian companies, and then of course we see Israeli and um, US, uh, US and UK based companies that have experience of having fought wars. And so they, um, the people who, you know, the, the Navy or Marine um, officers who fought those wars then set up these businesses. Among these um, is a company set up by Eric Prince, who's a former U.S. Navy SEAL, um, who set up a company in Abu Dhabi in UAE, and he provides his services for uh, that kind of a security, but also other kinds of logistical services um, to ch particularly Chinese companies in East Africa. So what we see is these kinds of intense connections between an American guy who set up a company in the Middle East, who provides services to China, who does work in East Africa. And so you see these global webs of security that are emerging in those areas. In terms of your question about economic zones and uh, free trade zones, one of the things that we've seen is also that with, uh, partic in particular with containerization, but of course, um, special uh, economic zones and free trade zones emerged long before that. What we're seeing is an intensification of the, um, distinction between different legal regimes on port and off the port. So what do I mean by this? We know that in colonial times, a lot of colonial uh, powers, the French, uh, but also the Spanish and the British and many others in, in their colonies, established ports that were considered to be free ports. Part of the reason for the 
establishment of free ports uh, was to allow for encouragement of the trade through those ports, uh, but without, like, for example, taxation or provision of fees. Um, the effect of this uh, was variable. Some most ports actually didn't benefit from this, in part because that meant that no fees for the transit went to the ports themselves. Um, but in some other ports thrived on this. After the Second World War, we, see, we saw an intensification of the emergence of these special economic zones and free trade zones. Um, there's an anthropologist, uh, Patrick Neveling, who's actually writing a really amazing uh, piece of research on this. But one of the things that he discovered was that essentially these special economic zones provided um, a new legal regime in which particular labor taxation in corporations, so who could own a corporation, et cetera, and other kinds of services um, would be established near to a port so that it could benefit from the proximity of transport infrastructures, um, but could actually also uh, then avoid having to pay the taxes or fees, be avoid the paying the customs or tariffs or other kinds of forms of control that the city itself would have. And so we've seen this model of special uh, uh, economic zones or free trade zones growing very close to ports, no. um, uh, actually expanding extensively throughout the Mediterranean. And you'll see these in actually in almost all the large modernized Mediterranean ports you'll go to. Um, their benefits are hard to see because in many instances, as I said, they provide a legal regime which uh, suspends taxation, uh, but it has become a model. And I think the pushback against them has to be local, has to be from the local areas. Um, Thank you for your very good question. I um, appreciate it. Thank you so much. Time is beginning to, to, to be observed, but uh, we have a question about taxes and this from Hans Verstier Abarif Paev, and he says, uh, is there any uh, international body who actually allows or doesn't allow those new taxes that are appearing because of the COVID? Um, keeping in mind, or let's keep in mind, please, um, that as you said before, that the federal customer is the one who is to assume this cost. Um, that's a very good question. So I think that part of the sort of the avoidance of the taxes, it's been a it's been a long standing thing, and and I think the struggle for the payment of uh, taxes has to address the question of offshoring, not only of ownership but also of um, the, uh, the 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 you know, the question of the um, uh, flags of convenience. Um, and then, if, of course, there's a question of corporate taxation at the top level being uh, paying. Um, I don't, I, it's interesting because the International Maritime Organization, which is the primary organization that deals with questions around maritime, it's a U UN organization, tends to be quite secretive, tends to actually act on the uh, to the benefit of the, um, uh, of the bigger countries. Um, has not done very much about this. Um, uh, Olaf Merck of the International Trans uh, Transport Forum of the OECD has been trying to do valiant work to draw attention to this underpayment of taxes uh, in COVID time. Uh, but again, this requires the kind of global coordination um, that is often quite difficult to get. Now, one of the things that we have seen is in the last uh, year, actually, um, the US, surprisingly, has spearheaded an attempt to introduce a global corporate tax, and this would extend also to offshore havens. And this minimum global corporate tax would be something like 20 to 21 percent. And so this 20 to 21 percent global corporate tax would presumably also apply to uh, shipping companies. However, in a way, um, those massive subsidies uh, kind of off, uh, in a way, offset if they pay higher taxes, those massive subsidies um, offset those. And so whether or not those subsidies will go away uh, is difficult to see. I think in part, competition between China, for example, and the EU might force the EU to uh, drop down some of its subsidies. China, for example, might uh, refuse to uh, cater to those and, or might have um, 
reciprocal kinds of subsidies or punitive measures. And so I, uh, it, it is interesting to see that on the one hand, you could have this kind of a competition between China and the EU, but also a global coordination on corporate taxes could potentially be uh, an effect uh, that, that could cause this um, avoidance of tax issue to go away. All right. Time is almost over. We have two questions. Um, what is from my own, I must say, I must confess. It is uh, briefly, would you see um, the forcing impact of the sea road that is arriving to the Mediterranean zone by the port of Trieste, which is expected impact? Yes, um, and, and the port of Piraeus also. So one of the things that's really interesting about that is the extent to which... Um, on the one hand, there's a lot of concern about One Belt, One Road. Um, the effects of the, for example, um, the, the potential effects of this on um, labor conditions or environmental conditions is quite significant. It also results in some ports um, receiving different kinds of routes of transport than others. And of course, the ownership of particular ports um, uh, could translate into the movement of those port infrastructures out of the public hand, whether that's municipal or the central government, into the hands of foreign investors. So those are concerns around this. Another factor, however, that is quite interesting, and I have been tracking this, is that a lot of people who are actually looking at One Belt, One Road, uh, one of the, or, or the Belt and Road Initiative, is one of the things that they're seeing is, the, is that this is often translated into massive infrastructure um, investments by China in ports and other kinds of transport infrastructures. This could potentially result in competition between different ports. So in the Eastern Mediterranean, we've got uh, Piraeus, but we also have Chinese investment in the port of um, uh, Haifa. And there's also even com conversations about Chinese investments mm. in a Northern port in Lebanon or in a Southern port in Syria. And so this multiple investments by China in all, all of these ports could potentially translate into these ports becoming more major hubs for transportation of goods from China than there are than Western ports in uh, or Western Mediterranean. Although having said that, you, of course, you're going to need to have ports in the Western Mediterranean precisely because of the distance between uh, Western Mediterranean and the hinterland, for example, to Germany or elsewhere, uh, or Central um, Europe, being, um, uh, or to France, in fact, being a lot smaller. And so I think while this, the Belt and Road Initiative, could have an effect in increasing the number of ports in Eastern Mediterranean, um, I think there's going to be some effect, also, uh, some kind of trying to catch up with that in the western mediterranean as well all right thanks so much we have the last one from again from a blanca uh, comes over there she's saying um i have another question if there is time and there is uh, has to do with your own field work research uh, if you could explain please how easy or difficult it was to approach cma cgm and to get their authorization to travel with them thank you um, so that was actually quite easy. And in part, the reason it was quite easy was because I actually didn't approach CMACGM. CMACGM uh, and Grimaldi lines and a few other shipping lines are surprisingly open to freight or were before COVID uh, to uh, freight travel by passengers. So I actually bought, uh, got my um, time on board the ships by going to a freight travel agency, a travel agency that specializes in freight tourism travel um, and and so I chose the, the the list of the ships that I wanted to but if you actually do a Google search for freight um, uh, tra uh, the tourist travel you'll probably find lists of ship shipping companies that will allow that and there is actually the next one that I really want to do once COVID is over and ships will probably take on passengers again would be one that goes all the way around the Mediterranean I think that that would be quite a fascinating one um, however having said that um, a very good friend of mine Charmaine Chua who is born worked on Trans-Pacific shipping, she actually approached um, Evergreen, uh, the Taiwanese company, uh, and told them that she was going to do research. And they had her, for, they had her sign a number of different kinds of uh, agreements in terms of not revealing the ship that she traveled on, the name of the work, people that she interacted with, etc. But they allowed her to go aboard those ships. So it is possible. Uh, I think COVID makes it a little bit difficult, but perhaps after COVID, uh, it would be much easier to do so. So thanks again. The time is definitely over. This is a very interesting subject. Many thanks for you.
So for explaining all those things, giving all those data with a very simple, you know, way of, uh, of teaching. So thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, thank you so much for the people at the backstage, you know, for the leaders and all the people at the IMET for um, Elisabetta. And thank you for you all who have been here. So thank you to you all. Uh, we'll keep in touch and wait for the uh, forthcoming uh, lesson. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much, Sergio, for um, managing this panel. Thank you so much, Elisabetta and IEMED people, for your astonishingly good organization. Um, and thank you, audience, for your very good, uh, brilliant questions. And good luck with um, your studies. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good afternoon. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.